the healing power of stillness. So stillness is a topic that has meant a lot to me over the last few years. I think for any of us that live in this modern, fast paced, busy day to day world, uh, finding peace and stillness within is really key to having a healing mindset for ourselves and for the world. And finding that stillness is, is so important to not just do it in the morning before we start our day, but to find it throughout our day. Whenever, even when, especially, I guess, when we're in the midst of a stressful moment or maybe um, feeling like we're getting some pressure at work or from family members, when we're dealing with a long to-do list and feeling like the hours in the day are just too short for us to accomplish all that we need to accomplish, that those moments are when we need stillness the most. So for example, I used, someone asked me once about how to find stillness or how do you practice it? And, and really it's, it's the days where we feel way too busy to be still, to, to find moments of quiet. Those are the days we need it the most. I know that uh, Gandhi once was asked, um, he, he used to get up for, um, I think about three hours before the start of his day and he would meditate or pray or, you know, in his own way and have moments of quiet and one day, for about three hours. And one day he said the day before to his students, his pupils, he said, I have a hugely busy day tomorrow. It's jam packed with activities and events and places I'm going and things I have to do. And so his students said, oh, does that mean that you're going to spend less time in the morning, you know, in, in prayer and in quiet? And he said, oh, no, that means I'm going to spend an extra hour in prayer and quiet in the morning. So he spent four hours instead of three. And of course, that's not requisite to practice stillness. But I love the message of that, that when we're most busy, when we're at our busiest times in life or the times where we have the most chaos, the most challenge, the most things going on, that's where we need to pause and take moments throughout our day to really reconnect with the quiet, the peace within us, that doing that helps us to accomplish better all that we have to accomplish, better than any organization or to-do list or activity could do. At least that's been my experience. So as we talk about stillness today, and as you're getting into the topic here, you can start to think about maybe a place that you've been or a time in your life when you've felt that peace and that stillness where your thought has really quieted down and been still and, and where that was for you and what that looked like. I know for me, it used to happen when I would climb mountains and I would do lots of mountain climbing um, a few years ago when I lived up in Vermont in the United States. And when I would go to the top of a mountain, inevitably, it felt like every step of, of the way that I was just losing a worry or a concern or something that I was sort of ruminating about or overthinking about or analyzing in my thought. And by the time I got to the pinnacle on the top of the mountain, all those thoughts would have just been kind of left on the trail somewhere. And I could feel this incredible quiet in consciousness that allowed me to sort of take in and soak in the beauty of the view and the quiet and the sounds of nature and, and the sun or whatever I was seeing that particular day. And, and then what happened is as I started to go back down the mountain, back to my car, back to the traffic, back to all the tasks waiting for me at home, that I would ponder how to bring that, that mountaintop moment you know, into my daily life. And that's really the question of stillness, that it's not enough to just have our mountaintop experiences and then have to go back into the rat race of life and, and feel the stress and pressure. That what we're looking for is to carry that with us. And the reason it, we can do that is because it, it really comes from within. It doesn't really come from being on the top of a mountain or being in nature or being by an ocean or whatever you think for you. The origin of the peace and the stillness is within our own hearts. And so, even in the midst of the daily activity, we reconnect with it 
by quieting all the ideas and the thoughts in our head and looking within and really turning to our own hearts to listen to the moments of quiet, to hear whatever message we need to hear for that moment in that particular day. And so the question is, how do we do that more consistently? How do we practice it? And what effect does it have on our lives when we do that? So that's what we're going to talk about today. And everything you're going to hear tonight comes from my healing practice of Christian science. And as I'm sharing tonight from, from my own heart, from the things I've, I've experienced and practiced in my life, I hope that you hear a message speaking to your own heart too. And that's the message that you really need for tonight. So pay attention to that message that's coming to you individually as you're listening. We'll start off today and I'll um, just open up the slides now. And we'll just start with a story of a cellist. We're gonna go back in time a little bit to 1992. And this particular day um, in Sarajevo, this man walks into the central square and he puts down a cello case and a plastic chair and he proceeds to start playing his cello. And as you can see in the photo on the screen, there's you know quite a lot of dis destruction around him and rubbish and rubble and because the city's being destroyed, it's being bombed. So there's artillery shells falling on buildings and people have, have taken refuge and cover. But this man comes into Sarajevo, not just this one day, but he comes for 22 days in a row and plays his cello amidst the violence. And he did this to commemorate 22 men, women, and children that were killed in a breadline at the start of the war. Now, when I heard this story, it really touched me to think that, that somebody would, would would see the destruction of their, of their beloved city and would think I'm gonna go out and play music in the middle of it. Regardless of my own safety, regardless of what's around me, that, that that's what I know how to do, I'm gonna go give it. And I'm gonna give it for 22 days to commemorate the 22 people that I'm thinking about, that I'm, I'm really, um, that have touched my heart because they were killed at the start of this war. It got me asking the question, that I think applies to each one of us, which is when we're being bombarded in our thinking, hopefully not physically, not bombarded like in a war zone, but bombarded in our thoughts by feeling overwhelmed or feeling anxious or feeling, um, maybe we're being bombarded in a different way, almost by isolation or emptiness or feeling purposelessness or just feeling like we're not sure where to start with life or, or or why we're doing what we're doing, that we're looking for the meaning of things. Whatever it seems to be our distractions or our, our bombardment, can we go out into the midst of life with, with offering the little bit that we have been given, whatever that is for each one of us, and bring sort of a deep settled calm and stillness to whatever we might have to face out there, whatever conflicts, whatever challenges, whatever problems we have to solve, whatever relationships we're dealing with, whatever unsolved issues might be going on in our lives that we'd love the answers to, whatever those things are, can we ground ourselves in the stillness as we go forward? And that's the question of the cellist to me. This man was the, the principal cellist of the Sarajevo Opera Orchestra. And so this is what he knew. He didn't know how to broker peace between the warring factions of his nation, but he knew how to play music and that's what he offered to his community. So now you're seeing a quote by, um, that someone sent me a few years ago. And it says, at the center of the most turbulent heart, there is a place of peace, a place beyond time that cannot be touched by change or by loss. No tumult can disturb the quietness. No shadow can dim the light. Here, in this stillness, is rest and healing. Nothing we suffer, nothing we fear, can damage its perfection. Now, we'll just unpack this quote for a minute here and just look at a little bit at what it's saying, that, that first of all, the stillness is a place that's so deep within our nature, within how each one of us 
is is sort of created our 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 whole complete identity includes stillness and it's this perfection of stillness that even the events of our lives the things of loss the things of change the things that we that we wish didn't happen to us or or we'd like not to happen to us the you know financial woes or you know things we're we're working on in our lives that that this peace and quietness is so deep within us. It's so ingrained in who we are that it's not affected by those, those sort of outward events. If you picture an iceberg, um, you know, an iceberg is, is generally known that, that it's only, I, I, I don't know, eight or nine, maybe 10% of the iceberg is above the water. And if you Google it online, you can Google this image and, you know, and you can see underneath the water is where you have almost 90% of the iceberg. And, and it's those things underneath the surface. It's in the depths underneath the surface that the power is. And, and just like that iceberg. And that's what this quote is, is really telling us, that, that we find the stillness deep within our own being, our own identity. And that, and that nothing we are afraid of or that, we are, that we've suffered can, can hurt it, can, can take it away from us. And so sometimes it just remains for us to really rediscover that that deep settled stillness and calm in ourselves and how that can affect our lives in positive ways in really transformative ways now there's an analogy that helps me think about stillness and it's based on the cello uh, the, this instrument you see on your screen and the cello like a violin if you play violin or, or cello it, it's it's an instrument that that plays well when it's in tune and to tune the instrument, you, you turn on, well, one way to, to tune it, if you don't have a, a um, perfect pitch, you know, you can't hear the note in your, in your head. One way to do it is to turn on a tuner, an electronic tuner, and it will play this pure, perfect note. And then you play the same note on the instrument. And, and if it's out of sync, you can hear these vibrations that, that tell it that it's out of sync, it's out of whack a bit. And then you turn the knobs. If you look on your screen, you'll see these little black knobs down on the bottom that you, they're called the fine tuners. And you just finely tune the instrument until it lines up absolutely perfectly with the pure tone. And at that moment, you can't distinguish between the original tone and the tone of the instrument. It actually sounds like there's only one note being played. And that to me is the goal of stillness, that what we're looking for in, in being still is to feel that we are so in sync with the divine. We're so in sync with God and divine love and divine presence that there's not a separation. It's not like we're these little people down on earth and there's this God, this divine presence kind of somewhere far away that we're trying to reach or we're trying to get to where we're not really understanding that it's a mystery and we don't really know what influence it has on our lives or if it influences our lives or how it kind of it intervenes in our own human experience. But well, you know, we're just going to kind of try to keep, keep having faith and maybe, you know, if we're good or if we're lucky or something, maybe this divine God or presence will somehow kind of help us out down here once in a while that, that really the reality is that, as we tune in to what God is, is doing, to this concept of God as, as not a faraway being or personified in some way, kind of looking down upon us in judgment or trying to assess if we're good enough, that, that actually God is, is like, it's, it's like the sunshine that just shines and goes everywhere. It goes into all little nooks and crannies of the cities. It doesn't distinguish between the beautiful parts of a town and the, and the rougher parts, it's the sun just shines sort of brilliantly on, on all. And it, as we turn our face to the sun, we feel the warmth, we feel the rays, we get the light of it. And, and that's like this instrument tuning into that pure and perfect tone, that God is this force, this presence of love that is in, it fills all space around us. And sometimes it's just as simple as sort of tuning ourselves or turning our face towards that divine goodness. 
and, and remembering to do that throughout our day, that it's not so much even about sort of, sort of uh, being able to, to have the Bible nearby or some sort of scriptural or inspirational text, but, but just knowing that presence of God is, is closer to us than anything else that we're doing. So to me, this analogy of the violin helps and the, and the cello helps in that at any moment we can fine tune ourselves to hear what God is saying. And the more we practice tuning in, the more aligned we feel with God, the more oneness we feel, and, and the less we feel separate, like we're trying hard to be spiritual, we feel our spiritual nature at the core of who we are. And, and that is, is what stillness, that's what getting still helps us to feel. And in those moments, we feel that deep settled calm that's within each one of us. Now, Christian science is it was founded by a woman named Mary Baker Eddy. And she said this, this once, she said to some students, she said, keep your violin in tune. And I, I love this because the idea, again, metaphorically, is that we're wanting to keep our, ourselves as kind of that violin in tune with God. That God's voice, that the ideas from divine presence are so alive in us that they are more present with us than our own thoughts or than all the other kind of thoughts that roll through our heads during the day. And, and we're going to go into that more in a little bit about how we do that and what are some things that can help us to sort of tune in to God's voice, to that divine presence and quiet sort of all those other, other voices outside of us. Now there's two real kind of keynote ideas for our talk today. And, and the first one comes from Psalms 46 in the Bible. And it's just this really simple statement that says, be still and know that I am God. And, you know, really that's the essence of it for me is, is this phrase that it's talking about being, it's, it's, a, it's a way of being, of being still and quiet and knowing something, really knowing that God is there, that, that presence of God is sort of right there. And, and that being still in this way, to me, th this, doesn't, this doesn't mean we have to um, like physically stop what we're doing, although sometimes that can help. But the, the stillness is, is, a, is a mental state. It's a consciousness of, of, of not feeling like we're filling our lives with so much activity to avoid our thoughts or, or feeling like that the, the, the ideas that will pull us down a road of, of anxiety or worrying about ourselves or fear for ourselves or for others or for the world, that, that those thoughts are sort of quiet, quieted a bit and that we're stilling the thoughts so that we can hear again, more of that divine presence. And Mary Baker Eddy explains this in her book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures that explains the Bible. It's a book that, that in Christian science, we use as a companion to the Bible. We read that we study the Bible. And then this book really gives an explanation of the ideas in the Bible. The Bible sort of has all the religious Christian ideas of Christianity that are so integral to any Christian religion like Christian science. And then the science and health book really takes those religious ideas and says, how, what's the spirituality behind it? How does that get practiced and lived in life? And how do we do that? And so this is one example that Mary Baker Eddy says that we hear God when our senses are silent. And, and I think this is important. I, I remember um, the first time I, I, I traveled to Africa, I had wanted to go for about 10 years and I, I was in Kenya. And um, I was talking with some, some friends I had met there and they were telling me about these various different parables and sort of uh, ideas and insights that they had in, uh, in their culture. And one of them is this, one of the ideas is that God, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. Now, I loved this when I heard it because I, I think it's the same idea of the quiet and the, and the solitude, the, the sense of being still, that sometimes in our, even in our thoughts during the day, we're just talking, talking, talking all the time. And that it's really about listening twice as loud as, as we speak, that that's what prayer is about. And, and that's what it means to me to quiet the senses, that rather than looking and observing and listening, you know, hearing noises and things and happening around us and all the perceptions that we see kind of in our environment, that we're sort of 
putting all of that aside to look at our mental environment, our mental state, and to, to, to find that quiet, this, that, that, that we silence all of those other things to find that place of spirit of God. And again, those are our keynote ideas. And we're going to have three parts today that kind of help us break this down. So the first part to break it down is looking at how we can do this for ourselves, how we can find the stillness in ourselves and what it looks like to really be at peace with ourselves. So we're going to talk about that first. And then we're going to talk about being still and, and really seeking God, seeking out God in life and, and how seeking God in the midst of our relationships with others changes those relationships. So that'll, that'll kind of be the second part. And then the last piece we'll look at is just being still and listening to our own heart, which is all these are these be still quotes here are, are just paraphrases from the Psalms about, about stillness and about um, sort of the, some of the Psalms and, and songs and the Psalms about being still and, and what the effect is. And so the last one about listening to our own heart is, is really about how we can not get agitated about world events and be more effective at at being sort of change agents for the world from, from a metaphysical standpoint. So from a prayerful standpoint, from a kind of a, a Christian standpoint of, of praying for the world, of wanting to see, wanting to make a difference. And so how do we do that from a place of stillness? And why is that stillness important? And how does it help us about the world? So, so that's kind of where we're going. So we'll start off with you know, this part about, again, being still, be still and know that I am God and how that brings healing power to our own individual lives for ourselves. And the first, so we're going to start off and this is where you can kind of chat in a little bit. So if you're on your computer, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open up the chat box right now. So if you go to your, your menu and you find where it says chat and um, I'm just going to open up the chat box. Most you should be able to see what each other are chatting and I'll repeat it as well. And for any of you that are not finding the chat box or tech savvy. But the question that I'm going to pose to you, and I'd love for you to just chat in your ideas as you, um, again, go to the toolbar that you see on your screen. You might have to click more. If you click on it, there should be a chat box and it'll open up and you should be able to type in into the chat box. And what I'd like you to, to think about or to share your ideas on is what characteristics do you find when you are at peace with yourself? So that's the question. What characterizes being at peace with yourself? How do you know when you feel at peace with yourself? And what we're going to do to prepare for this question is just take about 10 seconds or so of, of stillness and quiet. So if you're multitasking at home on your computer, or if you're in a group of people listening or watching and chatting at the same time, or whatever you're doing for now, just put everything aside. And we're just going to take about 10 to 12 seconds and just be really still and try to Try to find that sort of mental quiet and kind of shut the door. You know, Jesus talked about praying by, he said, go into your closet and shut the door. And, and sometimes for me, shutting the door is the hardest part of it. But as we, that's what we're going to try to do and, and find that, that just a, a few seconds of stillness. It really doesn't take 20 minutes or half an hour. It can just be a few seconds that reconnects us with this moment. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then after that, you can just share your ideas of what it looks like to be at peace with yourself. So let's just take 10 seconds together, wherever you are, and, and, and quiet everything and find that stillness. Go ahead. Okay, so you can come back together now, wherever you are. And if you want to go ahead and just chat into the chat box, any ideas that you have about what characterizes being at peace with yourself? How do you know? So um, one of our participants said that when you wake first thing in the morning, you start by expressing gratitude for the day ahead. So gratitude, feeling grateful is, is a way for me to sort of reconnect with that peace with ourselves, finding that stillness and that peace within, that when we practice gratitude and feeling grateful. So that's a great, that's a great um, characteristic of being at peace is when we feel 
grateful. And sometimes when I'm working with patients, because um, I work full time as a healing practitioner of Christian science. And so I work with individuals who are relying on prayer for healing. And, and when they call, sometimes the challenge they're having keeps it them from easily finding that gratitude. And, and sometimes when we talk about looking for gratitude, it, it can feel sort of inauthentic at first. It can feel like, well, I'll, I'll say things that I'm grateful for, but well, I don't know if I really feel grateful. But what I have found is that by practicing the gratitude, eventually our feelings kind of catch up. That it's not, it's important to try to find the most authentic gratitude, but, but that really as we practice it, that's what allows the, um, that's what allows for our feelings to kind of start getting there as well and feeling actually really grateful. All right, so I, I don't know if any of the, the rest of you are um, able to get into the chat box or not, um, but you can just chat again, any little idea that you have like gratitude or anything else that would be a characteristic for you of what it looks like to be at peace with yourselves. Uh, oh, someone just wrote in and they said that for them, it's assurance that God is right there with them. So for example, first thing every day, it's very normal to hear a phrase from sort of one of the hymns in Christian, so one of the Christian science hymns, for example. Um, or this person also said they, they wake up in the morning and they think, good morning, Father, good morning, God. And that's a, what, just a wonderful way to start the day, I find. Um, and to really have that expectation that it's God's day, that the day is, is, is already complete from the start, that we're not sort of going through our day to completion and then falling asleep at the end of the day and waking up to do the whole thing again, but that there's a sense of completion, that, that being at peace with ourselves is understanding that the way that there's a divine control on the day so that we don't have to make things happen, we don't have to feel in charge all the time, that we can respond to the, what God is doing and the way that God and divine presence is unfolding the day. And that's very different than feeling like we're the ones making the day happen or having to create it ourselves through our own efforts. Okay, uh, one other idea, and then we'll um, kind of fill it in with the slide here. But this person says she feels at peace when she her thought changes from looking inward to looking outward. So sort of in, in the sense of like, rather than kind of always gazing at our own selves and our own challenges and problems, but that our thought is kind of broadened to look at and, and think about others. Um, one of the things that um, the phrases in, in Mary Baker Eddy's book, Science and Health, is that blessed is that man who seeth his brother's need and supplieth it, seeking his own in another's good. So this sense of, of looking for others, looking for to, to benefit others, that, that we're blessed when we are really able to feel that we can be there for others. And that's a great way to get over that isolation or that sense of emptiness or lack of purpose is to start posing that question of how we can be useful to others in our, in our lives. All right, another person added that um, she feels at peace when she knows she's kept her thoughts and heart pure for that day or at least turning the error in thought, kind of turning it around quickly and moving on. I love that. I love that, you know, sometimes when we talk about, there's a bunch of things I'm just going to talk about there. So the error in thought. So that's, in Christian science, we have this term error, which is, is um, a word for uh, those moments when we are, um, when, when we're sort of accepting something about ourselves or about others or about life. And we've, it's a story that we've started to believe is true, but it often focuses on limitation or lack or a sense of loss, or perhaps um, it often involves a sense of fear or worry or concern. So any of these kinds of, I guess I would sort of term those kind of negative thought patterns that when we notice those, that we kind of characterize those in Christian science as error thoughts, that they're mistaken thoughts about our true identity, about our true purpose, about the reason we're here. And, and they, they distract us from sort of a spiritual identification with ourselves and sort of understanding ourselves from that spiritual standpoint. So what she's saying is that 
she's at peace when she notices those sort of erroneous kind of error thoughts, negative error thoughts, and turns away from them quickly and doesn't ruminate about them or analyze them or get into them, but sort of turns from them quickly and moves on in life without letting them kind of drag her down and, and, and keeping her thought and heart pure. Now, just for a moment, I'm just going to say this word purity is a really good sense of being at peace with ourselves. And for me, purity is a word about not being mixed. So if there's a pure metal, it doesn't have an alloy in it and it can't be magnetized by anything. A pure metal like gold, for example, cannot be, you can't, you can put a magnet on gold, but it, can, it doesn't stick. The magnet doesn't pull it because it's pure. There's no alloy in the metal to attract the magnet. And so what I love about that for ourselves is that that's, that purity is really about not feeling mixed or not seeing ourselves as, as confused or in chaos or pulled in different directions, that we're seeing sort of a clear, pure view and that that moves us forward. And so I like that idea of feeling unmixed. All right, one other idea here. Someone said, um, sometimes when we wake up in the morning, we feel impressed by sort of our to-do list or all the things that are on our plate for that particular day. And that being at peace is being able to know and listen to what God's thoughts are. That's, so that's, that's a great addition. So thank you, Sharon, for adding that in. Really knowing God's thoughts and kind of putting away the other thoughts that would tell us, that would keep us focused on all the things we have to do and, and the stress or the pressure. All right. Well, thank you all for participating. I'm just going to um, just close up the chat box for now. So if you have other ideas or questions or comments, put them into the Q&A box that you'll see on your screen, and we will get to them uh, near the end. But I just want to summarize. So those were great ideas, like a few more ideas that maybe we didn't touch on, that being at peace helps us to enjoy the present moment, that it keeps us from judging others harshly or ourselves harshly, that we become sort of no longer interested in or ruminating about conflict in life, that we're just really focused on um, kind of that present moment and, and living in that moment that we're not focused on rehearsing old conflicts or worrying about future conflicts, that we're just, we have this overflowing gratitude and appreciation for others. And we feel connected to others in, in unique ways, in ways that we can, couldn't have expected, that was maybe serendipitous or unexpected, or just kind of came up to us in life without us orchestrating it or making it happen, that we just find ourselves in kind of the right place at the right time connecting with the right people and, and things seem a little less um, difficult. They kind of flow in a way that feels effortless, but that's a sense that we're at peace with ourselves and with God. Um, and, and then again, we talked about this already, but the willingness to let things unfold from God rather than making things happen. For me, that's really kind of a key element. And I'm just going to tell you um, a story now that, uh, especially about how this last one um, that last point sort of really was brought home to me uh, a few years ago. And it was at a time where I um, had a lot of, of things on my to-do list. Um, I had family coming into town. I was getting my house ready. I had a lot of projects going on for work. Um, I had demands by my children and, and by the, pe the people I was working with and a big caseload of patients, et cetera. And I was just feeling um, a bit of responsibility for all of these things. And one morning when I woke up, I um, felt uh, um, some discomfort in my shoulders and my neck, and it was extremely stiff. And I, I was very, it was a bit painful to turn my, my head either way. And, and so I, I started off my day as I usually do in prayer. And I was, I spent, I was really looking, turning to the Bible and to the science and health book to um, just really sort of understand better about God and kind of start off my day thanking God for the day. But I could feel this particular day that my to-do list and all of the activities that were on my plate were sort of creeping in, in my prayer moments. And it was like, I was trying to shut the door, but it was really difficult. And so um, I ended up going throughout my day and, and really hoping that I would find relief from this pain as the day went on, but it didn't happen. And the second day I woke up and there was more pain and more discomfort in my shoulders and my neck. And by the third day of this, I still hadn't found any relief and it had gotten so excruciatingly painful that even trying to turn my head just a millimeter 
I, I just, it's everything was seized up entirely. And it was so excruciatingly painful that I had to just try to sit completely still and not move a muscle so that I could avoid the, the pain and the experience, the experience of pain. Well, as I was sitting still on this third day and wishing that I could be down with my family and, and getting the house ready and getting all the activities accomplished and running the errands I had to run and et cetera, et cetera. As I was, as I was putting all of that aside, because I was not able to do it at this point, because the pain was too intense. I started to turn away from all of the senses, all the things I was thinking about, all the thoughts that were racing in my head and to really start to just listen in that sort of deeper way. Kind of like in the beginning, we talked about how that calm is at the heart of our identity. And so it was almost like with that iceberg analogy we talked about that I was going beneath the surface to look deeper within my own consciousness, my own heart to see and to really listen for the voice of God speaking to me. And as I did that, I heard this idea. It said, I am the shepherd. And I took this idea really to heart because I had been feeling like I was shepherding all of these things, these projects and the patients and my work and my family members and the house that needed to get ready and the meals that needed to be cooked and, and all the, the financial projects that were sort of going on. I mean, everything felt like I was shepherding just so many things. And I was trying to hold them all up in the air and keep them all you know, organized and get them all done effectively. And now here I was unable to do any of it. And so as I started thinking about the shepherd idea, I realized that if this was God, if this was the voice of God telling me that God as the father mother representation of, of the divine was, was shepherding me, that that meant I had to be like a sheep. And then I realized, you know, I just didn't really like the sheep very much. I, I felt like I had grown up thinking I should be a leader, not a follower, that we should be sort of in charge of, of our lives, not let other people be in charge of our lives for us or dictate things for us, that we should really find that confidence and that leadership skills and all of these things that I was taught in school and in, in undergraduate work and in graduate school, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, here I was feeling in charge of all of these things and yet unable to do them. And what I saw as I started to really, again, put aside all of what I needed to be doing and be pondering this relationship I had with God, that I had to value the qualities of the sheep more. Now, this was a little challenging at first because again, I thought, well, what does it look like to be a follower? And what does that mean? And, and how do I change from feeling in charge to feeling like I'm now following God? But that, it ended up being this real mental shift from feeling like God was kind of the, the you know, again, this personified being that we call upon to come in and sort of help us in our lives with the things that we have to do. That actually, we are the outcome of what God is doing. That, that God is, is the, the, the power that moves us, that places us where we need to be, that puts us in right relationship with others in our lives and with our projects, with our, the things that we're responsible for. And that as we understand the shepherding of God, what that does for us is that it enables us to feel that divine presence to feel at peace in our thoughts and bring that to everything we do. And that getting there for me this particular day meant that I, I just had to let go of feeling responsible for all those things and, and really cultivate in my thinking a desire to follow God better and to be more receptive, to be a better listener, to feel like my connection with, the, with God was more powerful than all of my to-do list. Like somebody mentioned in the chat earlier. And as I started to feel shepherded by God as a sheep, and I could feel, you know, the qualities of the sheep are receptivity and, and uh, trust and um, a sense of obedience, a sense of meekness, a, a sense of 
just, you know, again, that sense of just fidelity to that shepherd, sheep actually know the individual voice of their shepherd, different than all other voices, you know, of other people in the area. They can hear the voice of a shepherd and come running from nowhere. They know, they know that's, that's the voice of their shepherd. They know it so well that they, they're, they immediately respond. And, and so to know God's voice well takes practice, takes really getting those senses quiet and listening. But in that moment, as I started to feel that I was the outcome of God, not an actor unto myself, doing my own thing and hoping God would intervene, but, but really the outcome of, of God's being, that's, you know, the responsibility, the pressure that all fell away. And I just visibly, I could feel the tension and the tightness and the pain just loosen up. And, and gradually it just dissipated and went away. And the next morning, you know, after, after the pain was gone and I was able to rejoin my family activities, you know, I still had these worries that it would come back again because it had been a couple of days and I thought, oh gosh, you know, but like we talked about in the beginning, that even when we're afraid of something, that the peace that we found is deeper. It doesn't get touched by that fear. And, and in my case, when I woke up that next morning and I, I, I had this thought at first about, oh no, what if the pain is back again? What if I slept wrong and it's all gonna happen again? But immediately before I tested it to see if there was any pain in my neck, I just went back to that, that idea again, because you know once, once our consciousness has shifted, to understand a new idea, it, we can't actually go back. For example, once people knew the world was round, they, they, they couldn't go back to thinking and believing that it was flat, even though they looked at the horizon and it certainly looked flat, but they couldn't go back to believing that because they now had this new understanding. And my new understanding was, was this relationship with God, that I was the outcome of what God was doing and I couldn't get separated from that. And that stayed with me. And so there was no pain that next day. And it hasn't, you know, I haven't had that experience since of having that pain. And what, so there's a, a phrase that um, Mary Baker Eddy wrote in one of her writings. And she said that the, the rest that we're looking for, there's a rest in Christ, a peace in love. I'll actually just pull this up on the screen here for you real quick. And so that, so you can have uh the quote at your disposal here. So I'll just turn this back on and you should see now the quote, it says, there's a rest in Christ, a peace in love. The thought of it stills complaint. The heaving surf of life's troubled sea foams itself away and underneath is a deep settled calm. And that's what was happening, that this complaint of the body, of my shoulders and my neck and the pain was, was, was being stilled, it was being calmed. And, and that as my thought shifted from my body and my problems and my stress off of it to this relationship with God and, and finding that deep settled calm. So in conclusion, as we go to part two here, just finding peace with ourselves is, is really about understanding that relationship that we have to God and that all the qualities that come with that and what it looks like for us to be truly at peace. And as we focus on that, sort of identifying ourselves in that original identity with God, that that influences and changes the way that we perceive ourselves and experience life. And it changes even things like pain or illness or challenges like that. So being still, by going into the closet and identifying ourselves with those qualities of peace helps us to find that healing power from whatever we might be needing healing about. Now we're gonna look for now for a second at what it looks like to apply stillness in our relationships and how that can help us change our thinking about our relationships. So this quote you now see on the screen is what has helped me think about this in my life and that's, that letting the same mind be in you that was in Jesus. So having the mind of Christ. And this is something that Paul wrote. He wrote it to the Philippians and the Corinthians and the Thessalonians. And he said it so many times throughout his teachings in different ways that we have the mind of Christ. 
Now, the question, I guess, is, is what does this look like, the mind of Christ? And to me, it involves that we bring stillness to whatever we do, that we think from a place of compassion. And, you know, this is a challenge because we want to react sometimes to what people say or what people do. We find ourselves, you know, we hear somebody say something and we immediately start thinking what we're going to respond, right? We immediately think, oh, no, no, it's like this instead, or here's our argument, or, you know, that, that the mind of Christ allows us to listen actively to, to others in a way that, that really hears what they're saying, before we jump in and want to start arguing or want to give our perspective or want to defend ourselves or, or want to argue, you know, that before we get to that place, it, it allows us to really hear the heart speaking of that other person. The mind of Christ slows us down to think with compassion and to really listen for understanding the other person before we want to respond or react or, or give our perspective. And that's not to say we shouldn't, give our perspective or say what we want to think, but it, it, the mind of Christ, I think, is listens at such a deep level that it hears sort of the underlying heart of the matter as opposed to just what's on the surface. And, um, it, you know, it also involves the sense of equality that um, Jesus, you know, really expressed a sense of feeling connected, the sense of equality with others, not a sense of, um, of competition or comparison, that there was a sense of, of oneness and equality, um, oneness with God that, that made all of us children of God and equal in that in God's eyes. That the mind of Christ keeps us focused on God at the center, not putting ourselves at the center of things. And that we see that all of our thoughts come from God, that, that our true thinking comes from God. And, and the challenge is sometimes distinguishing those thoughts that come from God versus the thoughts that seem to come from elsewhere. And, and again, we talked a little bit earlier about sort of error thoughts, those thoughts that lead us down a path of negativity or of fear or of agitation or of annoyance or of reaction, et cetera, et cetera. That those thoughts are the ones that we wanna sort of let go of and that we're looking for the thoughts that reconnect us with that present moment and that reconnect us with gratitude and appreciation and, and focusing on God at the center of our lives and feeling the light that comes from keeping God at the center. So those thoughts, as we focus on hearing those thoughts from God, it changes the way we perceive others in our lives. And so I'm just gonna tell you a little story again for a minute here about a time when, when this worked for me. And the experience was with my, um, my one of my younger sisters. I have two younger sisters and I have, I have two children and, um, this particular sister of mine um, hasn't had any children of her own. And she used to come over, especially when I first was a new mom and she would come over and she's a wonderful aunt to my, to my children. And uh, she would come over and, and notice the way I was parenting and, and feel very inspired and compelled to give me parenting advice. Now, as I mentioned, she doesn't have any children. And so I, I felt, a bit defensive about my parenting initially when this would happen. And so I would find that as she would be starting to tell me things about the best way to parent my kids, that I would start to feel this sense of defensiveness and defending what I was doing and how I was thinking, et cetera. So this went on for quite some time and we would get in these little conflicts and we would try to kind of brush them aside and sort of move on. But there was this kind of underlying tension and discomfort and agitation and and one day as she was, as I knew she was coming over, I, I started to think about this from that standpoint of keeping God at the center and, and really thinking what would, how can I have the mind of Christ here? And what does it look like to, to think about this with the mind of Christ? And I realized that Christ was this influence that this divine influence of goodness from God directly that speaks right to our own consciousness in a way that is so irresistible that it, it keeps us from reacting. It keeps us from, from a sort of a, 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 an agitated response that would um, keep us in a pattern of reacting to others the way that we've always reacted. So as I was thinking about this Christ idea and that that 
was the only voice that could be present in my, in my interactions with my sister. That when she came over this time and when she started to sort of again offer her parenting advice for, you know, another time, that as I thought about the Christ at the center of our relationship, that I could feel myself stay relaxed. I could feel that stillness in my thought rather than the agitation. And what I found was that I, my response to her comment was, I don't remember exactly, but it, it was funny. It was good humored. And we started laughing about it. And we made it, I made a joke about something and we ended up connecting rather than disconnecting. And, and that tended to characterize how we went forward, that, that the change in the relationship happened knowing that there was that, that Christ influence was more powerful in consciousness than our own personal feelings, personal emotions, personal reactions. And, and that Christ idea, that mind of Christ is the most powerful thing going on between two people. And that knowing that connects us with stillness. It connects us to feel at peace when we might have been tempted to feel agitated or reactionary in the past. So I know we're getting uh, sort of near the end here. So I'm just going to, we're going to move on to sort of part three now. And, um, and, and I'll just share uh, one, um, let's see. Yeah, we'll move on. I'll, I'll just share one idea here about uh, Mary Baker Eddy. I'll pull it up on the screen here. You should be, um, ooh, let's, you should see Mary Baker Eddy up on your screen now. And you know the, the key about her contribution to this conversation that we're having tonight about stillness is that she, in, in her life experience, she could see how everything she did came from prayer, whether it was being healed physically of, of an incurable illness that she had, whether it was healing others in her lives, or, or just feeling that sense of presence of God, that it came from feeling that prayer was not only something that we did sort of in our morning routine or, you know, or when we're at church or, you know, but, but that it was sort of a moment by moment unity with this divine presence. And that that's that stillness, that stillness is found in that prayer and that prayer is found in stillness, that getting still is a way of praying. And that as we quiet ourselves to pray, that's where we find the stillness. So this characterized all of Mary Baker Eddy's life and her work. So it's really at the core of what she contributed to the, to to the world in that sense of prayer being not something where we're talking so much, but where we're really feeling that divine presence and that unity. And that that's where the Christ idea comes in and, and we are, where we are receptive to that mind of Christ that characterizes our relationships to others. All right, so we're getting, we're gonna conclude briefly now with part three as, as we come to the end here of our, of our web event tonight. We, got here pretty quickly, it, it flew by. And so we didn't leave a lot of time for our last topic here, but there's just one little story I wanna share with you um, that I think helps with this sense of really listening for God's voice and, uh, and, and letting that characterize how we approach world events. So this, this is a story I learned when I worked in um, the field of peace building years ago. And there was a, they were, someone held a contest for children to draw what they thought peace looked like. And the winning drawing, the, the design that they chose to, to win the contest was a rushing, roaring waterfall, tumbling over rocks and spilling down into a, a big pool below. And it was very turbulent. And as you can imagine, it's very loud by, these, by a waterfall. And the child had drawn this waterfall. And then next to the waterfall, actually just behind it on a little ledge, the child had drawn a yellow canary that was singing. And that's the, the image that they chose to represent peace. Now, what I love about this image and peace is that it's, and I, I hope you're thinking for yourself about what that means to you. Like, why do you think they chose that to represent that sense of peace? Well, I, I think for me, um, it gets at the sense of being undisturbed, that no matter what might be rushing or roaring or tumbling or churning around us, that there's, there's this sense that we can remain undisturbed, that we can stay in a place where our voice is not diminished, that we can hear sort of this, that still small voice, 
which is a, a passage from the Bible that talks about how Elijah, when he was in a moment of turbulence, how he heard God's voice came in this, this moment of stillness, that we hear it in, that, that in the stillness. And that the stillness can happen in the midst of the loudest situation. That no matter how loud the waterfall is, no matter how loud the reports are of difficulties in the world, and whether that's a recent school shooting in our communities in America, whether that's a, a new development in, in Syria where many lives are lost or uh, an un, unexpected bombing in Afghanistan or any number of events in our cities or our towns or our world on any given day that is tempted to, to bring us into dismay or, or even tempted to make us feel apathetic, like there's just so many problems, where do we even start? Or this sense of indifference about being able to make a difference in the world, that feeling like we can be like that canary and not get sucked in or pulled into the turbulence and, the, and, the, and, and whatever might be spilling over in the news cycle that stillness helps us to get, to get quiet, to quiet the thoughts about the news, to connect again, like tuning ourselves in to what God is telling us, tuning ourselves to that, that experience of in consciousness, of focusing on, on sort of the higher understanding of, of, of life, of, of listening for what, what God has to tell us on any given day. And as we listen, we, the way we hear God's voice is, is just, it comes as our own thoughts in terms of, our, of, of being inspired or having a thought we didn't consciously think about, but that brings us peace. And whenever you have a thought like that, it is so important to notice it and pay attention to it because that, that's the thought that you need to, to contribute. And every thought like that really um, tunes us in with, uh, with what God is saying. It's like that those little thoughts of inspiration are tuning us in to God's voice and to what God is telling us on any given day. So, all right, just to conclude here, we're just going to summarize briefly. And I, I know we covered that last topic really quickly, but you know, as we're, as you're practicing stillness, and I hope that you leave this web event tonight with just a little sense that throughout your day, when you're about to make a phone call at work or you're about to go run an errand or you're about you're in traffic and you're driving or whatever you might be doing on any given day, you're in the grocery store waiting in line and wishing the line was shorter or at the bank or wherever you might be, that in those moments right there is where you can connect with stillness and just feel yourself relaxed, feel yourself connected, tuning into that oneness with God that that helps you calm yourself. And then it helps, it can help in your relationships with others that the mind of Christ helps you to look beyond someone's behavior to really see the heart of what there's, of who they are and to see that, that mind of Christ in them, just like you see it in yourself. And to know that that's, that Christ idea characterizes your relationships. And then finally, it, with the world, that as we, Learn, work to sort of not get sucked into the waterfall of ideas that's spilling out about world events that seems to come at a 24-hour constant cycle through the news, barraging us all the time with new political ideas that might dismay us or new ideas that might pull us down a direction and feel like we're getting sucked under the water of, of, of all of these things going on in the world, that if we stay above it like the canary, that each new thought we get that inspires us chips away at sort of the mental blocks that would keep conflict and difficulty and inequality perpetuating itself in the world. Every single prayer chips away at the mental blocks that would try to perpetuate those challenges. And that's what brings healing to the world. As thought changes, every good idea in the world started with a thought, an idea. And so as we contribute to the, those ideas that are transformative, we're contributing to changing the events in the world. And finally, that being still is what helps us to discover the reality of spirit that already exists. And it tunes us into what God is doing in a way that we feel like we're the outcome of what God is doing. 
And that's what results in healing. So just to conclude tonight, and um, I'll just share an idea from Mary Baker Eddy here that she said that this mind, this divine mind revolves on a spiritual axis and its power is displayed and its presence is felt in eternal stillness and immovable love. That we feel the presence of this divine mind of Christ in eternal stillness, in those moments of stillness. So my hope for you, my wish for you tonight is that, is that you feel and take with you some practical idea that you can put into practice about practicing sort of stillness in your life, feeling that, that because it is, it, it is a practice. It's a, it's, a, it's a practice of thinking and of turning ourselves sort of away from what, what might be in front of us for that moment to connect with that deep settled calm that's underneath the surf of the, the, the swirling surf of life, of life's events. And that as we connect with that deep settled calm, we find the stillness right where we are. We can bring it to whatever we do. Thank you all for participating tonight in this web event. It was recorded and it will be, um, uh, it will be sent out to all those, those of you that were registered. You will get it in your email box in a day or so. Um, and so I'll just say thank you all for coming tonight. I'll leave the question and answer box tonight open for a few minutes and we can just chat on the question and answer box. If you have any questions or any comments you'd like to make on um, following this web event. I'll leave it open for the next 15 minutes. So if you'd like to stay on and, and see people's questions and answers, there will be um, just some, we can chat a little bit with the questions and answers. But otherwise, again, I thank you for coming. And um, I hope you have a wonderful evening of stillness. Thanks so much.